Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today, I'm going to talk about the phrase, the personal is the political, and how the ideas behind this phrase and the implementation of those ideas by people in control of your entertainment mean, A, you're never going to be able to use that entertainment as any kind of relaxation, any kind of escapism, and B, from such people, you're never going to get an actual good story. You might think, in the end, they'll come around, and eventually they'll start producing good stories. But if they hold on to such a mentality as the personal is the political, no, they will not. But before we get there, just a quick update on my graphic novel, Thomas Valiant. I plan, as I'm uploading this video, to take down the Indiegogo page and close the entire thing. Renzo is one page away from finishing the art for the entire book. My colorist, who is very fast, actually has about, I think, 10% of the pages left to color. And my letterer is even faster than that. And although he's working on the last pages of chapter two, and there's three chapters in the book, he will certainly get through them with speed. So what got me thinking about this phrase, the personal is the political, is a Marvel podcast entitled, The Personal is Political, an interview with Bobby Chase. Now, I will link where that interview is on the Marvel page. However, if you're listening to this in the future, just know that Marvel switches these things up so many times that it may no longer be there. But along with the link for this that I'll put in the description, I'll also put the full title so you can go to the Marvel website and just put that in there and hopefully find it that way as well. So Bobby Chase was a editor and eventually ended up being an editor-in-chief for Marvel Comics. However, this was at a time when they had five editors-in-chiefs because they had broken the company up into five sections. But I want to look at this woman specifically and what she says, because she came into Marvel Comics around 1989. This was at the time when Jim Shooter had just left Marvel Comics, and the people who were in control of Marvel Comics at the time, although they were a little looser than Jim Shooter, had the same kind of mind as Jim Shooter as to how the characters should be treated, how stories should be produced. And having covered an interview with Jim Shooter just a couple of months ago on my channel, I think these two people, Jim Shooter and Bobby Chase, are two prime examples, two avatars of the way that comics used to be made and the way that comics are now made. And I would say that is the same for stories themselves, how stories used to be treated and how stories are now treated. So although I'm dealing with comics, I'm dealing with the concept of story. I'm just using comics as my entry point into discussing the story. So let me give you just a little bit of background. Jim Shooter started working for DC Comics back in the 1950s. He is very old school, and he is quite of the mind that there is such a thing as a good story and a bad story. Now, whether he knows it or not, this comes from a mentality that goes far back into the reaches of Western civilization, and really is the mentality that helped produce Western civilization over a number of millennia. And it's two simple ideas. And those two simple ideas are, number one, objective truth exists, and number two, we can know what it is. And this is reflected in Jim Shooter saying things like, this is a good story, or this is a bad story. Now, they may seem like very innocuous, very commonplace things to say, especially when you're an editor or editor-in-chief, but really, it goes back to a mindset of, yes, there is objective truth, and we can tell from that objective truth what is good and what is bad. And in the interview I covered a couple of months ago about Jim Shooter, he was talking about producing the story The Phoenix Saga within the X-Men comic books. And he was talking to Chris Claremont, the person who wrote the story. And Chris Claremont originally wanted the story to end in a way where Jean Grey just went back to being Jean Grey, just went back to being an X-Men, and that was the end of the story, and everybody just forgot about all the things that she had done as Dark Phoenix. And Jim Shooter relayed the story that he said to him, you can't do that, that's a bad story. And he went on to explain to him why that was a bad story, saying that she blew up an entire planet worth of people, and before that, an entire starship worth of people. You can't just have her go back to being what she was before without any consequences. And Chris Claremont said to him, you're trying to put some moral imperative in here. And Jim Shooter's answer to that was, no, it's a bad story. Because this is not the way people act. This is not real. 
And that's exactly what he's pointing to. He's pointing to an objective truth to say, this is how a story actually should be, and we can tell whether it's good or not. So that's the old way of looking at stories. Now, Bobby Chase looks at stories in a new way. Although she started in 1989 within Marvel Comics, she is definitely of this quote-unquote progressive mindset that you see within comics today. Now, very briefly, I'm going to relate to you what she describes herself as within this podcast. Now, she calls herself a Northeastern liberal, and she talks about her upbringing, wherein her parents were both very political, and around the dinner table they would talk about politics. And what does she say her parents were? She says her parents were socialist Democrats. And not only socialist Democrats, but registered members of the Republican Party. And no, you didn't hear me wrong. Yes, they were socialist Democrats who were registered members of the Republican Party. Why? Because number one, they lived in a conservative place and they wanted everyone else around them to think they were conservative. And number two, they wanted to subvert the process of the primaries within their area for Republican candidates. And they did so by pretending to be Republicans. So that's how she describes her upbringing. And it will not surprise you, I don't think, to learn from that that when she got to Marvel, the people at Marvel, who had a Jim Shooter kind of mind still, said to her, look, you gotta take your Northeastern liberal sensibilities and check them at the door. Not everybody in America thinks the way that you do. Not even the majority of people in America thinks the way that you do, nor the majority of the people who read our comics. So you check those things at the door. And what she did was, she said to them, yeah, yeah, and then went about subverting the process of telling the stories. And the funny thing is, the person who's doing this interview with her is gushing over some of the books that she did. Some of the books from the 90s. Those books which the quote-unquote progressive people just haul out all the time to say, look, Marvel was always progressive. But this woman, Bobby Chase, she's telling stories which show the exact opposite. She did stories where she took this character, North Star, who was a perfect example of a ladies' man, and she turned him gay. And he was the first openly gay character within comics, supposedly. And then she took another story, which was from Hulk, and she talked about the AIDS crisis and got one of the characters to die from this and so told the story that way. But she says she knows that Marvel did not want these stories. And she quite specifically says that if she had taken these stories to the higher-ups at Marvel, they would have rejected them. So what she did was, she just went ahead and did them anyways, working upon the principle that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. So with all that firmly in mind, let's go into the mindset of why she is doing this and the mindset of the personal is the political. Because remember, of course, this interview with her is titled the personal is political. And by the way, I listened to the entire thing. I don't think they ever use that phrase within this podcast. So someone at Marvel knows enough to connect the actual ideas that they were talking about with the phrase, the personal is the political. And what were they talking about? Well, they were talking about feminism. They were talking about diversity. They were talking about point of view. And they were talking about the Marvel concept of the world outside your window. And this is how they believe they construct a good story. Now, here's the thing. This idea, this phrase, the personal is the political, comes from second wave feminism. But in order to get into the origins of what it really means, I'm going to go a little farther back than that. Hopefully I'll do so with some speed. So this idea really comes from a philosophical idea of imminence. Imminence being that it's contained within the thing, usually within either the universe or within the individual. And it comes in its modern form anyways. I could go back to the Manichaeans in the 4th century and probably before that to talk about it. But let's go back to Spinoza in the 17th century. Now, Spinoza was a Northern European Jewish philosopher, and he didn't like Judaism at that time. So he decided to come up with what was basically a pseudo-secular religion. Now, first off, just let me say, in order to do so, he had to develop a thing which was basically called doublespeak, so that he could actually try to teach this to people without the authorities knowing that he was doing so. Or at the very least, get his ideas out to people without the authorities tracing them back to him. And this pseudo-secular religion is based upon the concept that 
There is nothing actually outside of this world. This world is all that there is. And therefore, if you want salvation, you need to get salvation in this world. And how do you get salvation in this world? Well, you get it through special knowledge, which allows you to save yourself. And that special knowledge all comes from inside of you. It doesn't come from any objective thing, any objective truth at all. It comes from within you. And by the way, this pseudo-religion that he wanted to develop basically divided people into two classes. He thought anybody could follow this pseudo-secular religion, but it would be divided into two classes as it existed within the real world. It would be the smart people at the top class, and it would be the rest of the herd at the bottom. Because, of course, this special knowledge, in order for it to be gained, in order for you to save yourself, must be done through intellectual rigor, and only the top class can have the time and the intelligence to actually do that. And the rest of the people that he thought could follow this pseudo-secular religion would be people who couldn't actually do such a thing, but they could act in a way that sort of, again, pseudo-monk kind of style living, and they would just take the scraps that fell down to them from the actual smart people in the upper class, and this would be enough for them to try and get, at the very least, a little closer to this salvific knowledge, which they could then try and save themselves with within this world. Now, for a second, let me say, does that sound in any way familiar to what you see around you today? A pseudo-secular religion, which came about through through doublespeak, which is based upon the idea that you need to have special knowledge, and that special knowledge can bring you salvation, and that salvation can lead to an almost utopian existence within this world. But here's the thing. For Spinoza, where this salvific knowledge comes from is through what he calls pure reason. Now, of course, this pure reason would be something contained solely within this existence here. It has no reference to anything outside of this universe. There is no transcendent truth. The idea of imminence is quite opposed to transcendence of any kind. Transcendence being that you get it from outside of you. Imminence being that it comes from inside of you. So, we take that basis of Spinoza, and we take it from the 17th century up until we have second wave feminism. And his ideas go through a number of European continental thinkers. And they can be traced first through Kant, and then the trio of people who I would say are really responsible for what we see around us today, that trio of thinkers being Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. But here's the thing. As we get this idea coming through history into second wave feminism, and it's coming specifically through these thinkers, each of these thinkers, and even some English thinkers as well, started to pound and hammer on the idea of reason being in any way preeminent or sometimes even useful. And so in England, you have Hobbes and Hume talking about the reason being subject to the passions. In Kant, you have his critiques of reason. And then you go into Freud, and he talks about everything just being a product of the irrational. You go through Nietzsche, who discards reason whenever it opposes his idea of dynamism. And then, of course, you have Marx, who discards reason whenever it gets in the way of his class struggle. So that's the basic philosophical background, and I mean really basic. But the whole point is, this idea of imminence comes into feminism, second wave feminism, where they develop the idea that what women really need to do is to gain their own liberty, which is code for salvation, in a way wherein they examine their own stories, and from their own stories, they draw out from within themselves their own liberation. Now, here's the thing. Since by the time it gets to second wave feminism, it has gone through all of those thinkers, and all of those thinkers have discarded the idea of reason as being really anything useful at all, when you get to these second wave feminists, how in the world do they do this process? First of all, they disregard any idea of transcendent truth. They disregard any idea of objective truth that is imposing itself from outside of them. Everything must come from within them. It must be subjective. And if everything is subjective, and this rationality has been discarded because it's based really upon objective things, if you're actually honest about how you use it anyways, then what do you have left? What is the language that you use in order to understand the individual story that is within you? Well, the thing that's left, the language that is left, is the language of feelings.
Now, just as an aside, you could say that this is possibly the result of all of those thinkers taking reason out of it, but it could also be the fact that, hey, you have this religion, this pseudo-secular religion, and don't you remember, it has the people at the top who are the ones who can actually think, and the rest of the people are just the common herd, and they just do what they're told. They just take the scraps that fall from on high. And of course, those people can't actually think, and so for this herd of people, all they can really do is deal in emotion anyways. So it's probably a combination of those two things that culminated within the expression, the personal is the political. Now, in defining this phrase, the personal is the political, you have to remember, this is a feminist phrase. And trying to define a feminist phrase is like trying to squeeze some water. It doesn't actually work because it has so many different definitions and has changed so much over the years that I'm just going to give it to you within the context that A was originally there and B connects with what we're talking about within the title of this podcast, which is The Personal is the Political. And it's the idea that women in order to get themselves saved, in order to liberate themselves, must again take their own story and examine it through their feelings. And once they have done that, once they have examined it through their feelings, then they can construct, they can manifest from themselves their own private truth. And once they have this my truth, then they can use that to help try to liberate themselves. And one of the key ways in which they do that is to join with other women who have done the same thing. Once they join with these women, then they exchange stories between one woman and the other, and they can see what is common within those things using, again, their feelings, and then they can have our truth. Again, this is all subjective truth. And once they take that and they do it with a bunch of women, which they need to do continually to gain more and more women to this cause, to share more and more stories, then they can take all of that, all of their experiences, and all of the our truth that they have produced, and all of the power that they have as this collection of people, and use it to then enact political change. And so they can take the personal, everything that is coming out of what is personal, and then enact political change with it. So the personal is political. Now, some of you might be saying, well, isn't this the way the political works? Well, no, it isn't. Especially if you look at the history of Western civilization. Up until very recently, the way that the political worked was through natural law. Natural law, you understand through reason and logic. And you take that reason and logic and you apply it to objective reality and you see what actually constitutes fulfillment for the human individual person and the human society, and you take a combination of those things, what fulfills the society and the individual, and then you say, this is what it is according to reality, according to objective truth, therefore we will implement it as rules within our society, as laws, and this is the morals of that society. And again, it's based upon objective truth, it's based upon logic and reason. But of course, this phrase, the personal is the political, it all comes from imminence. It all comes from that idea that everything comes from within the individual. There is no objective truth that you actually want to reference, quite specifically, since they have tied the idea of salvation to liberation, the idea of objective truth, the idea of reason and logic, those things are the opposite of liberation. Those things are oppression. Why? Because they don't come from within the individual. They come from without. They are something that imposes itself within the individual and says, you have to act in this fashion. Why? Because it's in accord with reality. And if you don't do so, you're just going to be smacked to the ground. But of course, these people disregard that. They think that's oppressive. And so they must only go with what is within them, what comes from within them. And I have to say that if you think that's a load of nonsense that I'm spouting off, again, I have to reference that old video that I did that came from the Smithsonian, where they had listed at the top of the supremacy of a certain kind of idea that would be white ideas, they listed reason and logic and reference to objective truth. And of course, what was the opposite in that Smithsonian article and articles like it? What is the opposite of that? How do you liberate yourself from all these things? By listening to people's stories. And by, by the way, not even questioning those stories because they're the lived experiences of those people. And so very generally, if we take what is going on within this podcast and talk about this idea 
Well, within this podcast itself, Bobby Chase talks about the fact that some people had come to her and said to her, why in the world do you need to take all of these characters, let's say these gay characters or these characters who are in the margins of society, why do you need to take those characters and make them part of the X-Men? Isn't it just redundant? Aren't the X-Men just a large metaphor for such kinds of people, for marginalized people? Isn't that what the story is about? And can't you just tell the stories that way instead of inserting all of these characters, these, let's say, gay characters within the X-Men themselves? Can't you tell the story that way? And she said, no, you can't. And she opposed that idea of just having it as a metaphor. Now, why would she do that? Well, because the idea of a metaphor that's the old way of thinking. That's to say that you have these people, these characters, which are a representation of something bigger than themselves, and that something bigger than themselves has a connection to objective reality, and that's how you can understand it as a metaphor, and that's where the essence of the story comes from. But again, that has reference to an objective reality. She doesn't like that. She wants everything to come from the individual, and so she needs to make these characters, and so the story comes from the the story emanates from the individual, and the meaning of the story emanates from the individual. And so that's just generally. But I want to go over first a couple of ideas that are connected to story right now, these quote-unquote progressive stories, and these things that constantly happen to our stories, which make people scratch their heads and go, why are they doing that? I'm going to go over a couple of those things first, and then get into what they talk about, which is diversity, point of view, and the Marvel world outside your window. Now, first off, what she was talking about when she said you need these individual characters to be the manifestation of what is going on within this story, this is very telling. And the way that they usually express this is that they talk about these stories being based upon the human. It's all back to the human. It's a human story. They use this phrase a lot. It's part of the humanity of the story. Now, again, double speak for these people. What do they mean when they say humanity? Well, what do they think a person is based upon? Well, a person in their minds is based upon feelings. Nothing but feelings. Again, this is in contrast to the old idea that Western civilization had for millennia that human beings were rational creatures. The core of a person is that they are a rational creature. But for these creatures who believe the personal is the political, they don't believe that at all. They believe the essence of a human being is feelings, is these primordial drives. And again, this goes back to people like Freud and how they use that to try to liberate themselves. Anyways, but when they say human, what they really mean is at the core of a human being is feelings and everything needs to be adjusted towards feelings. Again, this is how they examine everything is through feelings. Because, of course, examining things in the other way, examining things through logic and reason and objective truth, is something that is oppressive, and therefore you can't do that. So let's see how all of this plays out. First of all, let's look at the reason why these people cannot, even if their life depended on it, stick to any kind of canon. And not just canon that has been laid down by others, but even what they have said within their own story. You see stories on the page or on the screen, and you're reading it and you say, okay, you just said the exact opposite right here of what you said five pages ago. How does that work? Well, it works because, of course, they don't care about any kind of consistency in the story. Nothing about the story is about anything objective. It's only about invoking feelings. That's it. I actually was tagged in a discussion about this a couple of weeks ago where people were lamenting the demise of storytelling. And they were saying that a lot of these people know other people who only read stories because it evokes some emotion within them. That's the only reason that some people read stories, because it makes them emotional. That's it. If the story that they're reading or following doesn't evoke emotions within them, then they think it's a bad story and they no longer follow it. They disregard it. This is how a large section of the population actually reads the story, and it is certainly how these quote-unquote progressive people read a story. A story is quote-unquote good in their eyes as long as it provokes some emotion within the reader. And that's the only reason it needs to be there, and that's the only reason for the story. Because again, you got to remember, 
the only way that these people know how to interpret anything is through feeling. And so, as long as five minutes ago that part of the story evoked some emotion within you, and now this new part of the story evokes some emotion within you, and by the way, these have to be positive emotions, self-affirming emotions, that is to say, something that plays into their passions, but anyway, as long as those emotions are given to you in that moment, it doesn't matter if it contradicts what happened five minutes ago, because the point of the story is to evoke emotions at every point. The point of the story is not to be consistent. Being consistent is actually something which is oppressive. And before I move on to number two, I just want to connect some of those ideas I just went over with what Bobby Chase has to say within this podcast and with Marvel itself. Now, Bobby Chase, when she was talking about that comic where she had that character die of AIDS, that comic which Marvel would have rejected if she had brought it to them, but she just did anyways, she said the entire reason for that story was for a catharsis of emotion. Because she and everybody else in the office knew so many people who were dying of the AIDS epidemic because apparently in the circle of friends of people who worked in that office, they were dropping like flies. And so they needed a catharsis of emotion. And it was not just for them, but also for the readers to have a catharsis of emotion as well. That's why they subverted the letter page as well, so that this catharsis could have more impact. Now, a catharsis is a release of an excess of emotion. And again, she says the entire reason for this book was to release those emotions. Or how about the fact that I covered about two years ago this artist that was working for Marvel, and probably still is, and she said the only reason for her art is to show women feeling their feelings. And I could honestly give you another half a dozen examples like this off the top of my head just from the videos I've done on this channel. So the idea of emotion being the center of the story is something that is quite squarely fixed within the stories of Marvel right now. But I'll have to move on. Number two, this is part of the reason why such people use things like Harry Potter as their reference for everything in this world. You have these quote unquote progressive people, and they quote something like Harry Potter or sometimes Marvel movies as if it was the Bible. And a lot of people scratch their heads and go, why in the world do you do that? Can you please read some other book? Or maybe pick up a history book and look at that. That might actually be something that you would find actual information about that you could anchor in reality instead of tying everything to a fictitious character and story. Well, the reason why why they can't do that is because, again, everything is interpreted through emotions. Now, I'm sure at some point in their life, these quote-unquote progressive people did pick up a history book. Within school, they were taught from these books. They were taught history. But, of course, they were taught it in the modern educational way, which is to say they were given fractured knowledge, which has no connection to a whole, and were just told to memorize it, and then it just fell out of their minds. And that's okay, because the entire point of modern education is not to actually teach you how to think. It's to condition you in such a way so that you accept when people tell you what to think. And quite literally, that was one of the stated objectives of the original principles of public school. But anyways... So the point being that these people did learn history, I'm sure, at some point in their lives, but it all fell out of their heads. And it fell out of their heads because they didn't think it was anything important. And they didn't think it was anything important because when they read those dry old history books or text on this or that, it did not evoke emotion within them and therefore wasn't important and therefore they don't remember it. Because again, you got to remember, everything is based upon emotional interpretation by the individual. And so what do they have left as their point of reference? Well, they have Harry Potter. They have Marvel stories, because those stories evoked some emotion within them, so they use them as their almost biblical quotes to try to explain things. And the third thing that I want to add just very quickly is that if you think in this way, through emotion only, and think that reason and logic and reference to things objective is oppression, then you can't think in any other way. Because, of course, critical thinking is actually thinking through reason and logic. I can look at what these people think, and I can examine it, and I can understand why they do it. I don't accept it, I don't think it's right, but I can understand why they do it. That's what I'm doing right now. But they don't have the ability to do so. Because, as I said, 
If they only interpret things through emotion, and they have no ability to critically think, and they can't have that ability, because reason and logic, which is where critical thinking comes from, is forbidden because it is something oppressive, then they can never extract themselves out of their own mindset of this is the only way to not only interpret and read, but also to write a story. And so let's now get down to the nitty gritty, the nitty gritty of why they keep on harping about diversity and why you have to have diverse characters with different points of view. And this is the Marvel world outside your window. And in other podcasts, they talk about Marvel hiring people based upon having a unique voice. What does this all mean? Where does it come from? Well, it comes from the idea, again, that in order to understand anything, what you need to do as an individual is use your feelings to examine your story and then produce your truth from that and then connect with other people and share your story with them and they share their story with you and therefore you can then use this to enact political change. And so the thing is that in such a dynamic, some stories are more important than others. And what are those kinds of stories? Well, first of all, those ones which liberate you are more important, but also the more extreme stories, the stories that are more an outlier than anything else, are the stories that they think need to be told. Why? Because again, you want to share experiences in order to gain knowledge, in order to add to your body of knowledge, so that you can make our truth something bigger and bigger, more powerful, so that you can use it to enact political change. But if you have a group of people which are all the same, they're all going to have the same basic story, and therefore they can't get very far. So they need to take into their group more and more diverse people, because these diverse people have diverse stories that they themselves have examined and come up with my truth, and their my truth is something that is different from the norm of people in the group, and therefore it adds to the body of knowledge that allows them to expand their power to use it in a political way. So stories about, let's say, a white man who is heterosexual and is probably a Christian, those kinds of stories don't need to be told anymore. Why? Because they've already been told. People have already extracted the usefulness from those stories, and so they no longer need to be told. They don't want to tell those kinds of stories anymore. And this, by the way, just as an aside, is one of the reasons why Sana Aminat, the second in control at Marvel Comics, the VP of content and character development, said one of the most pompous and arrogant things I have ever heard. She said, too, and about the fans of Marvel Comics. She said, those fans might think they want those old stories, but they really don't. What they need to do, what kinds of stories they need to have, is stories from what they call unique voices. These unique voices, these diverse voices, actually allow for the expansion of their power, because it allows them, again, to expand their body of knowledge, which simply comes from individuals and their personal experiences and their examination of those things through feelings and then told as a story. And this, by the way, is why they have to, absolutely have to, match up the character with the writer. So if you have a female character, you have to have a female writer. If you have an Asian character, you have to have an Asian writer. If you have a Muslim character, you have to have a Muslim writer, etc., etc. And they've even gone so far with some stories to have five or six writers. And they have to do so because they have a whole bunch of different kinds of characters. And each of those writers has to write the specific kind of character that is in that story. So you have the black person, write the black person. You have the gay person, write the gay person. You have the Asian person, write the Asian person. You got the Muslim writing the Muslim. And so if you have a team like the Champions, which have all these diverse characters, you got to have five or six writers because you can't have of a different persuasion actually writing those characters. Characters. Why? Because, of course, the reason for the story to begin with is to take those personal experiences of the writer and for that writer to take those personal experiences and explain how he emotionally understood them and therefore produced my truth. And of course, a person who is white cannot write an Asian character and do that because a white person has never gone through those experiences, and therefore that is not an actual story in their minds. Or at the very least, it's not a story that has any usefulness at all. 
because it doesn't expand upon their feeling knowledge, their my truth, because it's not told by the person who actually experienced those things. That's why they absolutely need to match up almost exactly as best they can the character traits of the character with the character traits of the writer. And so they do this through what they call diversity and inclusion. They want as many diverse people as they can get. Again, because they tell unique stories, because they have unique voices, because this adds to their body of feeling knowledge, which adds to my truth, which adds to their political power, which allows them to enact political change, which allows them to be in their minds more and more free, which allows them to reach, at the very least in some small way, what they see as their salvation, which is the constant liberty the liberty that allows for nothing to impinge upon them except what they want, which is basically just the fulfillment of their own wanton passions. And so when you hear writers or producers of stories of any kind saying the words diversity, inclusion, representation, what do they mean? Well, they're going back to all of these ideas and saying, this is why the story needs to be told, and no other reason. When Marvel specifically uses now the idea of the world outside your window, again, they're talking about and referencing the idea that it is the emotional, it is the personal, that is what actually is supposed to be the center and core of their stories. Again, it all emanates from the individual and their feelings and their telling of their own stories. And again, the entire reason for all of this is to enact political change so that they can bring about their salvation of liberty. So, the reason for stories to begin with is all tied up in the political. This is why, if your stories, no matter what they are, no matter where they are, no matter whether they're tabletop gaming or video gaming or comic books or you're just watching television and movies of one kind or another, if they are controlled by people who have this mindset, this basis, as their idea of where a story comes from, it will never be escapism. It is not meant to be escapism. It is meant to be the exact opposite of escapism. It is meant to relay a story that is interpreted in a very specific way in order for very specific people to enact political change. And far be it from them ever settling down, Quite the opposite will be true. A lot of people might think to themselves, well, eventually they'll get this out of their system and then they'll go back to telling good stories. No, they won't. This process ensures that the stories that they're going to tell in the future are more and more extreme, more and more separated from the norm. Every time they tell a story, it has to be more and more separated from the norm. And so if the norm for storytelling has become everyone has heard this story about this gay character so many times, we're going to move on to something even more extreme than that even more different from the norm than that, because that's the reason in their minds for telling a story to begin with, to give you something more and more of an outlier, to give you something more and more out there, in order, again, for the people who read this story, to use that manifestation of power and liberation from the individual in order to further their own ends. They're never going to calm down. They're never going to say enough is enough. They're never going to say we won't cross this line. They will go constantly and continually in that direction of extreme and insane. And all because of a disregarding of the ideas of objective truth so that they, as individuals, can find what they see as fulfillment through the more and more extreme extension and manifestation of their own vicious passions. So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like. Hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe and leave me a comment. Tell me what you think about all this. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.